Hey, it's Sarah Burke here from the Women in Media podcast. And before we get started on a new episode, could I get you to hit like, follow, subscribe, hit the bell, whichever app you do your podcast listening in. Make sure you're all set up so you know when there's a new episode and you can help spread the word. Oh, and if you're so inclined, could I ask you to leave a review if the app that you're using does that? You're the best. All right, let's get to the show. I'm Sarah Burke, and this is the Women in Media podcast. My guest today has worked in the music industry for 10 years in marketing, PR, and management, and currently they are the manager of publicity services at Cadence Music Group and Fontana North. They also recently co-founded the first ever Canadian music industry LGBTQ2S Plus Advisory Committee, which we're going to get into. Someone recently looped me into an email, so small, and was like, hey, they'll take care of it. And I was like... You see me. I didn't have to like make a big stink out of it. I didn't have to explain that I'm like, I came out and just to be looped into a professional email with my proper pronouns was like so empowering. Erin Carroll is my guest today. Welcome. Hello. Wow. That was so fancy. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're so welcome. <laughs> I recently thought about something you said to me by email. Uh, when we were first starting to work together, when I first joined the team at Series XM. And by the way, thank you for being so kind because I remember, you know, early on in my career at Series XM, just thinking, wow, like Aaron is so nice. But at one point I emailed you and I said, thanks, dollface. And you yeah. wrote me back a very informative email, which I can't remember word for word. I mean, this is 2017, it's 2021 now. But I remember yeah. that being the first moment that I ever considered a perspective different than male and female in a work environment. And I wanted yeah. to thank you for that now, all these years later. Yeah, of course. It's so interesting because, you know, I've been like, I've been out as like queer for most of my career. Um, but I recently came out as non-binary um, like earlier this year, because we all had time to think about who we are in this pandemic. And it's been something I've obviously been, been thinking about struggling with for the last few years. And I remember whenever I get emails, especially in, in this media world, it's always like, Hey girl, Hey lady. I'm guilty of it. I know. Oh, and it's, it's totally fair. I am guilty of it as well. And it, there was a certain point where it started to feel really uncomfortable and I felt, you know, you are cool and I love hanging out with you and like you're one of the most open people to work with. And so I just felt very comfortable to be like, hey, like I appreciate this, but like I just, that doesn't fit for me and I like feel uncomfortable about it. So it's just like, I don't know, it's been like a weird thing that I've struggled with. And I think even in like my Twitter bio for a while, like before I came out as non-binary, like publicly and changing my pronouns to the, or like using the pronouns they, them, um, my Twitter bio was like, not lady. Like, I was just like <laughs> very upset about it. Um, but yeah, it was just like, it's a very small thing that people do that like, for some reason, just like really irked me. And it also made me think about how I interact with other people and the language that I'm using. I really meant what I said when I said thank you for bringing that to my attention, because you know, I think there are a lot of people that are just starting to think about these things for the first time now in 2021. And I'm grateful that I've been thinking about it for a few years and finding my way around it. But that being said, me being as open as you said, having these conversations and helping people understand what goes through someone's mind who doesn't identify as, as female or male or uh, could be really helpful in, in making this a more normal conversation and not being uncomfortable. Yeah. So, thank you for coming on the podcast. And I do want to say thank you too for helping with the launch a little bit because I had some conversations with you as I was trying to figure out if calling this podcast, you know, the Women in Media podcast would even be offensive to someone. So if we can break it down just to start, when you are grouped as either female or male, what does that do to someone in your position in your mind? It's different for everyone. Um, but like to my own experience, I can speak on. Um you know, I grew up socialized as a woman and I still strongly identify with my feminist side. Um, but it gets kind of frustrating in, in like the grand scheme of things. Um, like when I walk into a restaurant or like I, like I was saying before, like the hey ladies just being like automatically grouped into one or the other. 
um, is just always like, it's a weird, it's a weird place. It's not a bad thing. Um, it's just a, a thing that people should be considerate of in assuming people's gender and like not everyone, like I think that I'm very relaxed about a lot of things because I kind of come from a place of education and I'm totally cool being like, hey, you know, that's totally fair that you thought of this, but actually I'm non-binary and I use they, them pronouns and like lady and doll face don't fit for me. But not everyone feels that and not everyone needs to do that work and no one should be obligated to do that work. So it just kind of puts into perspective of how you shouldn't always assume someone's gender based on different, you know, physical aspects. Like I have long hair. That doesn't necessarily mean I am identify as woman. It goes back to just not assuming. You sort of just referenced it, but I remember a couple of weeks ago um, you had put up a post and it was uh, a dinner situation where the waitress comes over and says, Hey ladies. It was, it was an illustration of sorts in the music industry, in the media, you know, not everyone is having these conversations right now. Uh, there are definitely people trying to, where, where do we start with like, you know, whether it's a huge organization or, you know, a, an independent or a boutique organization, maybe you can speak a little bit about your experiences, you know, working with Fontana or Cadence and how all of this rolls out in that environment. Yeah, I think it starts, it starts in conversations it's easy to start off small and have conversations with people, you know, like, you know, your local queer like me who wants to have these conversations and wants to educate. You know, if you're someone who constantly sees non-binary trans artists or sees these things happening, you're like, what, the, what is that? What I don't understand. Um, Google is a really great resource. And so, you know, maybe starting in a small space of doing your own research is always really helpful, but just, I don't know, having conversations with people, looking at what's being covered. I think that we are in this like really interesting time right now in media and especially like obviously more specifically music media is that there are artists that are coming out as non-binary and are queer and are trans. And so we're having these conversations. And I think in entertainment, someone like Elliot Page, I think is huge. And like, he is a mainstream actor and he has come out publicly and I think in media seeing like in written media seeing people just like automatically not dead name him dead naming is when you use someone's old name that they no longer want to go so by Ella, it would be Ellen in in this uh, yes. conversation yeah. um so it's not saying like formally known as it's just Elliot Page has come out as transgender and so there was a lot of education going around online but how to properly talk about trans folks in the media. So that's, that's a good start. And, you know, in my office and, and I think in a lot of uh, industries offices this year, everyone worked on diversity training and yes. hiring folks to come in and speak to those like basics. Um, so that's really a good step. And I think, you know, it's really unfortunate that it took the George Floyd and all of the murders happening last year for people to be like, huh, maybe this is something we should talk about, but it is something we're talking about and it action is happening. And so, you know, as someone that's been advocating for years to see this like momentum happening, I'm like, hell yeah, like let's, let's hire those like diversity trainers. Let's have these conversations, let's have these conversations as a team. And let's have these people be part of our team. Yeah it's slowly but surely happening and going back and finding, finding resources on your own. Like um, I was very excited um, to come across this book. It's called they, them pronouns and it's for cis folks. And so cis folks are people that identify with the sex that they were given at birth. So if you were born a female, you identify as a woman, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but this is a really great resource. It's a little comic. What's non-binary? Why is this offensive? Like, why, like, why is it wrong to be like, they, them grammatically doesn't make sense. And like, it just goes into everything. So like, there's so many cool little resources. So finding things like that is always helpful. Yeah. Like you can find, you actually have the ability to find the resource that speaks to you the most right now. Cause there's so much out there. Yeah. And so 
I like even prior to this podcast because um, I'm not always like the most eloquent in my words. I kind of am like uh, I define it as this and that and go on like a long tangent as you've seen. <laughs> so it's like even like I googled. I was like, what is the proper de- uh, like definition of non-binary? And so like just to like make sure that I'm making it very clear for a, an audience that most likely is mostly cis, like uh, cis identified, and so. I just wanted to make sure that I like could could do it. And so if I can do it, you can do it too. Yeah. Anyone can do that. So. Yeah. And like there, like there's folks like yourself that are having the conversations and even, you know, what I really appreciated about you is like coming to me being like, Hey, is it cool if we name it this? Who else can we talk to? What conversations could we be having that doesn't exclude anyone? So like, those are like the way to start these conversations. Cause like, I'm hoping, you know, if someone is listening to this and is like, Hey, I never thought about it like this. To not be like judgmental about those who don't understand it yet and realize that everyone's on a, you know, a different uh, sort of learning field here. Yeah. I, I really appreciate that you even just explained like what cisgender means, because there's likely going to be someone who listens to this podcast who doesn't know. That's just yeah. where we're at right now. I mean, listen, I, didn't know half the things that I identify as when I was a teenager, you know, and we are in an interesting time in the world where there's so much information and there's so, we have like the luxury of online community and like, especially in the pandemic is like relating to other people who have similar stories and you're like, oh, that makes sense to me. That makes sense to me. I identify as this. There's just so much to learn and yeah all of that got you (laughs) so I I really thought about you a lot uh during like international women's day on a day like that where everything is women 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 like does that day mean anything to someone I think I think it's really important to celebrate women and all women there's like because I'm I don't fit in the square box of women doesn't mean that I don't get excited about having those celebrations. It's, it's a complicated, it's a complicated thing. I think what's important for International Women's Day and like what I kind of always think about is I'm like, are we making sure to include our trans women and making sure that their voices are being lifted up? And I think now more than ever, it's so important to lift up trans women's voices and especially on International Women's Day because if you see what's going down in the States for trans rights bills that are trying to be passed, it's, it's it's very upsetting. And um, people that are trans women are just as women as a cis woman, you know? And so it's really important to, to make sure that that's more inclusive on women's day. I think that's like my only like thing that I always want to be mindful of is that, you know, all women are being included and it's a good thing. And like you said, you still like identify with certain, you know, female things. Of course. And like, even like I have friends that are trans men. Um, They're not like, oh my God, I never want to like see another woman's day. It's like they grew up in a feminine, like in a female woman experience in their childhood most times. And being a woman is like there are so many things that need to be worked on and we're we're socialized as women and I still am physically people still physically think that I identify as a woman and that's okay I I, women's rights are so important like they're still so new and there's still like so many dumb things that we're fighting like even you know it's I could go on I'm gonna not rant on (laughs) it's still important it's still super important and it's not something that just because I'm non-binary, I'm, I'm mad about or don't want to celebrate because it is important. Yeah. Women's spaces and women's voices need to be heard. Mm-hmm. One, one thing I really wanted to ask you about, because I, I think the things that make me feel empowered are going to be different than the things that make you feel empowered. Can you speak about a moment in your career where you felt very empowered? Just as you, as Aaron Carroll. This is like really dorky. Um, <laughs> and it was very recently. And so, like I said, like I mentioned, I recently came out uh, as non-binary and started using they, them pronouns probably like middle of last year. Um, I came out more so to my friend group than professionally because it was a lot of work 
to explain to people what they then means and then switch pronouns. And so sometimes it's a little bit tiring. And I didn't know if I wanted to get into that. So I like slyly put uh, they, them in my signature. Um, and someone recently uh, looped me into an email, so small, and was like, hey, they'll take care of it. And I was like, you see me. Like, Aww. I didn't have to ask you. I didn't have to like make a big stink out of it. I didn't have to explain that I'm like, I came out and just to be looped into a professional email with my proper pronouns was like so empowering. I love uh, that. And not having to like come out because coming out is very hard. So do you remember when you, when you came out, the, the thoughts that you had leading up to that? I mean, I think um, coming out as non-binary is different for everyone. But from my experience, I was like, am I am I non-binary enough? And it like, I don't know if I like fit all the criteria. Like, I don't know, because like, I still really strongly identify with like my like tomboy ways and, and all of that. But the more I learn and the more I get to sit with myself, the more I realize like I'm not put into a box and I, I am non-binary. And yes, I have, you know, these like more masculine qualities. Like I like to identify as a skater boy spelt with an eight and the ending boy uh, ending <laughs> in an I. Um, and like, that's, you know, how I felt like I identify. And so it was just, it was a lot of like, am I enough? But, you know, there's no such thing as enough. What it means is I'm not either or. It doesn't, it doesn't mean you have to be a certain way. Yeah. Um, so that was like a big struggle. And then I came out personally and it was great. And I've yeah. come out semi-professionally and it's, I was, that was my biggest fear is like just doing the work of like, no, like this is my pronouns. This is how I identify. This is what it means. <laughs> like a lot of explaining to, yeah. Yeah. And so I think though, like just coming out at work was kind of like my, my biggest fear but it's so far been good. No one, it's been like, I've kind of kept it nonchalant. Also not seeing people in real life is also a luxury. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. 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 It might be, it might be a little more interesting once you get back in the office or something. Yeah, exactly. And I'm also like, I'm not mad when people use she, her pronouns with me. I, it's not triggering. Um, I just prefer they, them. Yeah. But again, it's different for every non-binary person, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you brought up a, an interesting thing about, you know, adding the pronouns to uh, your signature or even like your Zoom, you know, screen or whatever it may be. And I will admit that I originally thought that that was for people identifying as they, them. Yeah. I have recently sort of realized it's also an acknowledgement to do it for myself to respect anyone who doesn't identify as she or he and all of that. Exactly. And it, it makes a huge difference for people that are trans uh, in, in a workspace to just for all of the cis allies, cisgendered allies to have it, have their pronouns in their signature, because then it's like nonchalant, you know, mm -hmm. it's not like, oh, that's <laughs> the pronoun. Okay. Yeah. You know, so it just makes it an easier process. And like I said, coming out is hard and it's especially in a professional, in a professional space. Um, so not having to put someone through that by just yeah. the simple act of putting your pronouns in your signature. Yeah, it's easy. There's some really good articles about it. Uh, I'm happy to send it along. It's yeah, just, we'll throw it in the episode notes. Yeah, it's a very empowering thing. When we look at like Juno, CCMAs, like... Um, I'm trying to think of what other award shows that there are still some award shows that have a female and male artist of the year. How, how do we in being allies approach those conversations? I think that in this day and age, it's not fair to put people in those boxes for many reasons, not obviously number one to be inclusive of folks that don't fit into the male or female categories. Um, but also because like, why are we separating people's skills based on their gender? Like that doesn't make sense in today's day and age because like you're going to have five of the best artists and it's going to be like Beyonce, 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 and Beyonce, yeah. you know? So it's like, yeah. there's no reason for it anymore. It sort of reminds me of the indigenous, uh, you know, conversation about the indigenous music award category. And 
especially looking at like the folk music awards that just happened, the Canadian folk music awards, most of the contemporary roots uh, nominees and the winners were all from the indigenous category. And I just thought, look at that guys. Yeah. I think people will see, be surprised at how making little changes and not putting people into boxes makes a huge difference. There's, I just don't like, I, for anyone that has changed their inclusivity to like be more inclusive, it's been better. <laughs> like, I don't think yeah. it's ever like been a downfall for anyone. So I don't understand the hesitancy. Yeah, know, it never hurts anyone. Yeah, I, I think that, and like like you're saying, like I wasn't following the folk awards, but um, like you're saying, like those folks are the best in their game anyway. So like why put them in a box, put them against everyone, mm-hmm. right? Like we're so, especially in the music industry, there's so many boxes that people are supposed to be in, like best rock record, best R&B record, best dance record. But like everything is just like, like- Everything's like, very fluid right us. now, yeah. And I think like, even like you and I have talked about like, you know, programming and like what songs fit in what station. And it's it's hard to say, right? Because there's so many different- sounds these days and it, that's I, the part I hate about my job the most is stuffing <laughs> yeah. people in boxes and sometimes it has to be done with the way that systems have been set up and aren't changing anytime soon yeah and it's so unfortunate yeah. and, and the way I think about how music is becoming genreless um there's playlists on like Spotify that are like pollen and it's like it's genreless and like out, like same with like outliers because people are just blending so much and making new genres. And so ha- even having just like generic categories is no longer. So it's like, why can't we move this? Like, let's move our music genres forward, but let's also think about this in terms of gender and the way people identify. Because I don't know, I can go on for yeah. days, but I like read a really good book this summer about how all music, like all of like the best pop music is like genderless. And you look at like, David Bowie and Madonna and Katie Lang and just how the biggest artists always messed with gender presentations like even the Beatles gender bending like, as they call it yeah and like even like in the 60s like the Beatles were rebellious for having like women like haircuts and it's like music is always going to be the one at the forefront of like changing the game and so it's like why not catch up in our award categories right yeah, yeah. so Okay, this is a big question. If you could change <laughs> anything right now in the music industry, yeah. you you were top dog, you get to do whatever you want. What it, What is something that would mean so much to you to change? I mean, that's not a simple question. Like you said, there's so many little things that need to be changed. I think it's starting to happen and, you know, I've seen a lot of record companies starting to move forward with it, but like making sure to be more inclusive in rosters. Like, I think that is really important. And there's so many important rock bands that consist of like five cis hetero men that are fantastic and amazing. But I think it's time that we see more trans creators, more women creators, more women producers, brought to the forefront and especially in those major label lanes that that have that have the money to push that forward like I I think it's starting to happen um it's also like really important to like make sure that you know it's not just white people at the top of these rosters and I think Mm -hmm. that is is what's needed and taking chances on this is kind of like a rebellious statement, but like, I think the music industry is really scared to take chances on people that don't fit certain norms. And I think that that is not beneficial to anyone because the people, like if you look at music history and anything, the people that do the best are the people that are the riskiest. And the rebels. Exactly. And so, you know, it's easy to follow a formula and be like, okay, so we need to find the next Justin Bieber because Justin Bieber did well. It's, that's not what music industry should be about. And so I think it should be, I think A&R should be changed and being like, we need to find the people that are messing with everything, messing with genre, mess, like messing with gender norms, messing with the 
presentation of everything. So I, I think that that's like a huge change that needs to happen. And I think it's slowly happening, but I think people are afraid to to take that risk sometimes. Yeah. So, so your wish is for the music industry to take more risks if we summarize all yeah. that. Simple though, right? Take yeah. more risk. You have the money too, a lot of the major labels. To I mean, do they it. take risks, like, sorry, but like they take risks on things that are like super apple cut, like, like apple pie. And you're like, yeah, like it's cool, cool. but <laughs> like, are you changing anything? Like, yeah, yeah you got a, so- you got a million streams, but. <laughs> So, so tell me how you kind of got into media. You said something about Michelle Branch earlier. Oh God. (laughs) Well, no, um, it's not that long winded of a story, but, um, for your listeners, I am a publicist, so I am behind the scenes. Um, but before I got behind the scenes, I like had huge ambitions to be a journalist. I really wanted to be a music journalist because, I was very obsessed with um, Michelle Branch. Um, she is the best and I look for any excuse to name drop her. Um, <laughs> so I like when I was in like eighth grade, I used to write like music articles about her and I used to like want to like- Did you write for the school paper? Yes. So I remember reading I. Uh, Dallas Green in my school paper and I was like very excited about it. Um, but yeah, so I, I really wanted to be a journalist. I was really excited about it. And then I had some very bad teachers that were like, you're not a good writer. You should never pursue this. Um, so I went to school for communications because I was like, maybe I will get better. Um, and I fell into public relations because it was like one of the options at the end of my, my weird program. Like you can go into journalism, public relations or ad advertising. So I got into public relations because someone was like, you're basically doing what journalists do, but like pitching it to journalists. So wait, so, where did you go to school? Ooh, Laurentian, which is under heat this week because it has gone bankrupt. Right. <laughs> yeah. We'll just move right along from that. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> so um, long story short is through school, I discovered publicity and I am a big dreamer. And I was like, I want to work in music so badly so when I graduated school I moved back to the GTA and would go to shows by myself all the time I look back at that I'm like who was I I was so not afraid of anything but uh, I just was like I want to work in publicity and like kept meeting bands and I was like I'll do your publicity never worked out because I had no idea what I was doing but then (laughs) I finally like I remember even like asking the Elwins if I could do their publicity at the beginning of their days you know yeah um but eventually like I met someone and I interned and I like built my way into like a PR company and then I left that company and moved over to the label so I just like I really, the boy, the reason I got into it was because I wanted to share music with people and I thought that I was going to be in front of the camera, uh, but it turns out I'm better behind the camera. So. <laughs> You're very good at your job. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I love working with you when we get to, to work on something. Who are um, some examples of uh, folks in the media industry that you really respect and admire? I, I sent this podcast to you when you were looking into things, but Cameron Esposito. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, she's a comedian, but she has this podcast called Query. And such a good podcast name. I'm jealous of it. It's so good. And then she ends it with like, "Who's your queero?" <laughs> Love it. Um, but Cameron Esposito, uh, in her podcast Query, and she also does incredible stand up, was like really inspiring for me because she was just kind of asking people hard questions and she's talking specifically to queer people and it's just like so nice to hear queer voices like lifted up um like even today like you know when I was thinking of like folks that I wanted to recommend I was like yeah like who are the queer media folks that I love but I was like it's short it's like there's not a lot and that's why we got a one person by one person pass along the nominations and and yeah create more opportunities and want more queer folks to be in your position and want to be on radio and and things like that. So it's just like, yeah, so that she was just like a really inspiring person in media that I was like, this is cool. Like, this is really awesome. 
And we should link to her podcast in uh, the episode notes as well. Yeah, highly suggest it. And then, you know, the usual suspects of like much music, like continue. Like I love Strombo. That's so cool. Like getting to work with him now. Like he taught me everything I know about music. And now I'm like, what's up, George? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, And like even someone like Jennifer Hollett, who's like now like running Twitter. Right. So those were people that like were super inspiring and I as most Canadian kids wanted to be a much music VJ okay a bit of a, a tougher question like flipping that around is there anyone who has made you second guess your career you don't have to drop names or anything uh but a moment of weakness in the media because I mean I've had several and this is not an easy business to be in and I I really respect you finding a way to do this all with figuring yourself out yeah I mean I have been very lucky in my career that I have never had any problems um, in the sense of like homophobia, transphobia. Um, So I've never been in that position. Um, And same with like sexism. When I was coming up, you know, I had an interesting experience. It was a tough experience. Like anyone that has interned and wanted to like make it in music sometimes have to grind. Oh yeah. Um, when I was not making any money and working all the time and getting a lot of feedback, I was like, is this for me? Should I be working in music? Should I be working in media? Like, should I be a publicist? There was a lot of second guessing uh, when I was younger. And I think that comes with, um, what's it called? Imposter syndrome. Um, And just be like looking at other people and being like, I'm not good enough. I don't know if I'm ever going to be good enough. And like, I'm not doing what they're doing. So I don't know. I feel like almost every guest I've had on this podcast has at some point mentioned imposter syndrome. It's real, man. Like Mm -hmm. I, like at my old company, like I loved working there and it was such a great opportunity, but there was a point when it just like, it wasn't good anymore for me. And I, I second guessed myself every day. I like so much so that I quit music and quit my job. I worked as a nanny for six months. I was just like, I I didn't know that about you. Yeah. I was like, I don't know if music or media or publicity is for me. So I took six months off. um, And then like uh, Andrew Roach called me uh, who used to work at my label. And he was like, yeah, what are you up to? Like, you want to be a publicist again? And I was like, "Uh yeah, okay. (laughs) Um, And I've never like really second guessed myself since like I've just been in a really healthy work environment. Um, But yeah, so I think that, but I think it was just being young and being burnt out and trying to be like, I'm the best and not being the best, Mm -hmm, (laughs) you know, mm -hmm. what was the best piece of advice you've ever been given? Okay. I can't remember who gave it to me. I think it's been like, I think it's just been from like so many people over the years you're the only person that's ever going to advocate for yourself. So you have to stand up for yourself. You can't expect anyone else to do it for you. I used to be like, it's fine. Someone will help me out. Someone will do it for me. Someone will recommend me for this job, but it it never happened. And someone had said like, you just got to go out and try, like you got to do it. And that's just been like my motto since and just trying to advocate for myself in positions like when it comes to like getting paid, getting a job, even like getting press, like fighting for like why I deserve for you to pay attention to what I'm talking about. You know, like, I think that was such a solid piece of advice that I'd gotten. Mm -hmm. Again, I think it was from like multiple people over the year. I can't, I can't think of like specific people. That's a big one for me too. You're in charge of your own legacy. How do you want to be remembered? Yeah. Go make it happen. And like, I find, especially in the music industry with like the, um like old school boys club which is like changing but still um I still have to roll my eyes a bit but yes it's getting better still (laughs) it's still a thing it's like they're looking out for themselves so you have to look out for yourself right so I think that that's always been that was like such a shifting moment for me when I was like I have to be the one in charge of like fighting for what is what I need what's the biggest lesson you've ever learned in your career as a publicist uh know your audience um as a publicist it's it's really important to know your artist and get to know who you're working with I think it's so important to see clients artists as people and not just like this thing like this thing that you're selling 
um, and understanding them, that's been like a really important lesson. Cause sometimes I, when I was younger, um, there were some projects that I was like, whatever, I don't care about it. And I'll just try my best and got nowhere with it. And then the more I got to like know people, cause listen, I work with a bunch of genres that I don't necessarily love. Um, but I get to know the people that are making the music and it's made a huge difference. I agree with that statement too, for sure. Yeah. So that's really important. And then uh, know the media, for example, don't send rock music to a hip hop editor. You know, I, uh, I've made those mistakes. Uh, it's embarrassing. <laughs> um, and get to know who you're sending your music to. Don't just like blindly send it, you know, get to know the writers, get to know the radio people, get to know the producers, see what they like. And then when you eventually understand who they are, you'll be able to be like, hey, Sarah, this is a project that I think you would like <laughs> rather than like wasting your time, you know? Yeah. Cause you're busy and any person in media knows this is like, you're getting a thousand emails a day. So you gotta, you gotta be quick to the point and know what they want. Yeah. It, it, that is probably one of my biggest pet peeves as someone who programs music, knowing how many Sirius XM channels there are, <laughs> oh, you know, to be like, can you please fit this into your Sirius XM programming? I'm like, you're going to have to be a little more specific on where this pitch is uh, meant to land. <laughs> yeah. And like, hey man, sometimes I got to throw you my Hail Marys where I'm like, which is fine. <laughs> I'm like, please. <laughs> I think, again, because you work on developing a relationship and understanding the person as a human, then it's okay to say, would you consider? And, you know, might not be a fit, but you, you want to try. Yeah, exactly. Is there um, just a super crazy moment in your career that you would share? Like a crazy story? Because we do work in one of the oh, best God. industries. I have to think of one. I have so many. Uh, Something that brings you joy for this industry that we work in, because there's a lot of really good moments. Okay, it doesn't bring me joy, but it makes me feel powerful. Okay. It's my powerful moment. When I was like a young publicist, uh, I used to work for a festival doing PR for the festival. And so one of the fun things that we got to do was manage photo pits. And so managing photo pits is when, you know, managing the photographers, there's certain rules that come from each band. So it's like three, usually it's like three songs, no flash, and then they got to get out of there. And so they're... So my first photo pit was like Tegan and Sarah, who is my favorite band. <laughs> and so I was like so excited because I got to be like front row and I got to like manage these like photographers and I was so jacked up. Um, but then one of the photographers broke the rules. <laughs> this happens. This happens. It was during like one of my favorite songs. And I was like, no, man. Like I like was like, sir. Again, you shouldn't do this. Uh, don't just like assume people's genders. But I was like, <laughs> sir, you need to leave. You're no longer allowed to take photos. And like the security guard was like, yo, do you need backup? And I was like, no, I'm good. And I was like, you need to get out of here. And I was like yelling at him. And then I threw his camera down. It didn't break. It didn't break. It's fine. But like, I've never felt more powerful in my life. Just being like, you are not allowed to be here. I am in charge and you are not protecting Tegan and Sarah. Yeah. I feel it. Following the rules. I love rules. And the security guard was like this big six foot burly dude. And he's like, respect, man. And I was like, <laughs> thank you so much. I've never felt more powerful in my life. <laughs> so it was, it was nice to tell off some like, he was just like an old man. who's always been like annoying in photo pits. So it was like really nice to like mm -hmm. yell at him. That's amazing. <laughs> Um, so I'm very excited for you to tell me about, uh, your new project. So you've started, you founded, co-founded yep. an advisory committee looking to stand up for the LGBTQ2S plus community. It's called PRISM. It's an advisory committee. Explain how it all, all came together. Yeah. So it's in partnership with Music Ontario. Um, I wish I could give a better description of Music Ontario other than the one I'm about to give, but uh, they are great and they do a lot of advocating for artists and funding and do a lot of educational programming um, for Ontario artists. Uh, so they're great. And so um, one of my pals, Emmy, works there. And this was about two years ago, two or three years ago. Felt very alone in my queerness in the music industry, like on the professional side of things. And I was like, I just want to like meet other people. I had a few artists that I was working with that were kind of struggling with like 
being publicly out or like how to be out, like how to be out and it like not put them in a box. Um, Cause sometimes queer artists end up just playing prides and you're just like, no, like there's so much more than that. Yeah. Um, so just trying to like navigate that. So I was like, hey, can we maybe start like, they have a bunch of chairs, like uh, advisory committees for different genres and different aspects of the industry. So I was like, can I maybe start like um, a queer one? Because it'd be really important for me to like gather all my queers and like kind of figure out what needs to be done in the industry. Um, and so we, it was born and we have, um, I think six or seven of us that sit on the committee mixed with folks that work that are both artists as well as behind the scene people. So we have um, some like agents, we have some artists like Iskwe is on it as well with us. Um, and then uh, some music supervisor, someone from Music Publishers Canada. Anyway, so we got together to, to discuss what can be done, what kind of programs can we do. Like we hosted um, a queer showcase with North My Northeast, um, which was awesome. And we had people like Witch Prophet and Tika play. Things kind of slowed down at the beginning of the pandemic, but then we came up with a wonderful idea and I'm very excited about it. Um, we are trying to figure out what trans artists and professionals need in the music industry and how we can open more doors. So we sent out a survey in November and we got more than 30 replies, which is huge. That's like a big number to work with. And we just, we asked trans artists and professionals what they needed. What's missing. What, yeah. Like how can we help you get in the door? What do you know? What do you not know? What do you need? And so what we discovered was that a lot of folks just felt like they didn't know the industry at all and didn't know how to get in and wanted networking opportunities. And then the music industry has so many weird little bodies of ways to get paid. So like royalties, grant funding, and it's just like, it's a big world. And if you were not aware of it, right? So that's what we discovered from the survey. So we're creating in May, um, a like two day summit essentially of like a music 101 and some networking. Um, so we're gonna have panels uh, introducing po folks to things like SOCAN and Factor and like the different government funding bodies as well as having a few keynote speakers talk about like some trans artists that like are going to speak about their experiences and coming up in the industry. Um, and just overall have folks get to know each other you know, get to meet some other professionals. Um, and yeah, it's like, I'm so, so excited because nothing like this has ever been done. There's always things like women in the studio and- Women in music. So this is the first time in Canada, to our knowledge, um, that this is created, a program created specifically for folks that are trans or non-binary, um, genderqueer. So it's really important because it's just so it's missing and you know it's so important to have things like women and women in the studio and you know they've become more inclusive and it's like women and non-binary but sometimes if you don't fit a certain mold you don't fit in to those women in studio places and I would say that that's where you when when you feel the most comfortable is when you ask questions and you can comfortably gain knowledge that will help you towards your career, right? Yeah. Even like, you know, CMW used to do a women's breakfast. I don't know if they're still doing that anymore, but like, I do remember years ago, that being like a pretty important networking event for me when I yeah. otherwise wouldn't have felt as comfortable to just like take an event in like that. Exactly. And so we're doing that for trans creators and industry professionals. And I'm really, really excited about it. It's just so needed. And it just comes from like tons of conversations with people. And uh, one of the artists that I manage, T. Thomason, you know, he's like a pretty, he's trans and like very open about his experience. And, and him and I have just had so many conversations and to be able to bring, you know, these conversations over to someone like Music Publishers of Canada and Music Ontario and for them to be like, yeah, like, let's do it. It's so important and such a necessary move to kind of open people's doors a little bit more. Um, so I'm, I'm super excited about it. And exciting. just, you know, sometimes things move slow, but it's nice to see this finally like come to fruition. And 
if anything over the last year, and I think you were kind of getting at this, um, you can really feel progress. Even if it's slow, you can really feel it right now. It's, it's an exciting time. It's again, I, I've been advocating for these changes for years and like, not even just with like queer folks, but like making sure that like, it's not just all white folks at the front, you know, like it sucks that it took horrible events for the big guys to be like, oh, this is, this is something we should be careful about and we should be paying attention to. So I'm happy that folks are like, oh, let's do it. But yeah, it's moving slowly, but it's happening. And I'm so thankful for it. And I'm so thankful that folks are asking the questions or doing, doing research on their own and like figuring out that diversity pays off. (laughs) Okay. So we're going to put a couple links in the episode notes. And uh, like Erin said, you know, I think this is a big opportunity if you want to be an ally to ask questions and, and not feel uncomfortable asking questions because it shows that you're committed to learning. Be careful of the asking questions. Make sure that someone wants to be asked the questions. Yes. Like someone like me who is open to conversations, but not everyone is. It's a very good point. You're asking. Thank you for bringing that up. I, pre- <laughs> okay. I appreciate that. <laughs> so where can people find out more about uh, registering for the summit coming up with your committee with PRISM? We have um, an event bright uh, that you'll be able to register on if you are trans and more information will be available on the Music Ontario website uh, about what the summit is and what will be happening. So yeah, we'll we'll have the event right in uh, the show notes. And the way I like to end uh, the Women in Media podcast is by asking you about three people you really respect that you think should come on this podcast. Absolutely. There's a few that I've been thinking of. So I think one of the first people um, is... Jax from 99.9. Virgin Um, Radio Morning Show. mm -hmm. I think it's very exciting to have a very open queer person uh, on a major radio morning show. Like that's huge. Morning shows are huge and she's great. And I love listening to her. I also really enjoy watching her on TikTok and would love to know more about her. I don't know her personally yet, but I feel like we'd be cool. We'd be pals. So this is me trying to be pals with Jax. <laughs> this is basically us setting up your friendship. Sure. I'll work on that for you. Yes. <laughs> Who else? Um, I also mentioned her beforehand, um, but Cameron Esposito from Query, I think she'd have a lot to say um, about kind of what's happening in media and the importance of interviewing, like having queer folks interview queer folks um, and how important that is. So I think she would be another interesting person. Um, The next person that I would recommend would be Vivek Sharia. Um, She is um, everything. She is an artist. She's a visual artist. She's a a music artist. She just put out a play last year. She's also a um, guest on CBCQ who does um, all of the like pop culture breakdown and she's just like an incredible woman who has literally been in every format is a professor in like pop culture I believe and writing she's just like the most interesting and if you haven't heard of her I highly recommend you figure you figure out who she is because she is an icon and just doing so much for trans artists and I will listen to anything she puts out so I would love to hear you and her talk. Thank you so much again for coming on. Um, So good talking to you about all this stuff. And thank you for being so open to do so. Yeah, thank you so much. And I'm honestly so stoked for you to have this conversation uh, on a bigger platform because I think it's important and I'm excited for people to learn more and hopefully it opens some doors for folks. You'll have to keep posting about all the advisory events that are going to come up through this committee. Yes, don't worry. I'm a Leo and a publicist. (laughs) That's all I can do. So to wrap it up, the words of wisdom that you would give your younger self. Know your value. You are great and you can do it just by being who you are. The more I've come into myself, whether it be my queerness or it's just like more positivity comes and more even like career. Like I get bigger and cooler projects because I'm able to be who I am and people like who that is. So just like trusting that and not letting anyone tell you otherwise. Thank you to Erin for being so open to have that conversation with me. You know what? That's a conversation that we can be having with our friends, with our family, 
and with our coworkers, whether you work in the media or not. If you're enjoying the conversations I'm having here on the Women in Media podcast, it would mean the world to me if you would hit subscribe wherever you're listening. And to keep up with my guests and what's happening, you can follow along at Women in Media Pod on Instagram and Twitter or Facebook.com slash Women in Media Pod. This one time in Russia, I had boots with the fur and apple bottom jeans before it was a thing. This one time in Russia, my baba got mad at me for going out with wet hair. This one time in Russia, I had to put on all the clothes in my suitcase because it was so cold. And I should have listened to her because that same baba gave me a shot of vodka and a whole slice of lemon rind and all to cure my cold. Well, if you're interested in these stories and more, come check us out at the Russian Sisters podcast. The Russian Sisters, available on Apple, Google, Spotify, and at therussiansisters.com. Another Sound Off Media Company podcast.